Welcome back to Studio 14. I'm Kim Newcomer with the City of Fort Collins. Well, you know, I think there's maybe just one or two things in life that we can all agree on. And one of them is nobody likes being stuck in traffic. And, you know, as much as I have been known to maybe complain a little bit, I've actually learned that getting traffic lights to line up so that I can get to where I'm going quickly is a lot harder than it sounds. So today, here in the studio, I have with me our city traffic engineer, Joe Olson. Joe, thanks for being here. Sure. Look, I already have you know, nervous because I'm talking about how I, I, it drives me crazy sometimes when I hit those red lights. But I guess I kind of understand that you apparently aren't timing all of these lights for my commute. Well, we're trying to. <laughs> we're trying oh, to, for we're, me personally. We're really trying to time, time them for everybody's commutes. Uh, it, it can be a challenging task, as you noted, though, for a variety of reasons. Well, it is. And, you know, I think as a driver, it seems like such a simple thing, right? I just want my lights to sort of fall green one by one into place. But there's so many factors that go into this. Yeah, it's actually funny you'd say that because one of the things we hear a lot is why can't they work like they do down in Loveland where they have the one-way streets? Because right. down there it's so obvious as you're driving down that they turn green right at the right times as you go down them. And the thing that we have to remind everybody is those are one-way streets. And, <laughs> and the math is pretty simple there right. You know, to figure out how to, to offset those green lights to get them to do it. But the problem we get into is where you have a two-way street. If you set them up just to work for one direction, the other direction may vary well, get a red light every single light. And so, you know, it becomes much more challenging when you look at trying to progress traffic in both directions. Or if you have a grid where you're trying to do all four directions, right. north, and south, say, east, and west. Right, and then you have sort of the, right. the uh, perpendicular direction and it gets much more complicated. Right. So how does the timing of traffic signals work? You know, when I think of it, I think of it as just one road. How do you guys actually make the plans that help time the signals? Well, when people talk about like the best signal timing or optimized signal timing, there's actually a lot of different ways you can do that. I mean, one way would be to try to minimize delays at each intersection. Um, another way to do it would be to, to minimize the number of stops along a main arterial or some combination of the two uh, because they don't necessarily work hand in hand. Uh, to get that good progression up and down an right. arterial, sometimes we have to make the delays longer for the side streets in order to make that happen. Right. And so really the first thing you have to do when you talk about how you're going to time the signals is define what your goals are of your program and, and your, what, you're, what you're trying to achieve. So how do, we, how do we measure it at the City of Fort Collins? Well, we just, we just did a retiming project last year where we looked at all the arterial streets in the city and basically retimed them. And our goal of that project was to actually try to minimize stops okay. along the main streets primarily, at least during the busy times of day. Um, and again, what that can mean for the side streets is longer delays. But the overall benefit of minimizing stops is less fuel consumption, less air pollution, right. things like that. And so that's really what we were trying to achieve by trying to keep that flow going. Plus, it's as you noted, it's a lot less annoying when you're not just going from light to light stopping. Yeah, sure. And did we do all of the major streets in Fort Collins, or are we focusing on certain maybe high traffic areas or, or heavily used areas? We did all the arterial oh, streets wow. in town, so that would be College, Shields, Timberline. Harmony, you know, and, and others too, but basically all those big streets where we get the most bang for your buck by trying to minimize right. stops uh, is where we did that. What happens, because I, I know this happens a lot, uh, maybe a lot's not the right word, but what happens when someone requests a traffic light? You know, there's circumstances where people say, you know, I'm trying to turn out of my neighborhood, and I'm making a left turn in the morning, and I simply cannot find a break in traffic to do it. You know, city of please come and install a traffic light. You know, how does that happen? How does that process happen? And what does that do to then the timing of the routes? That's a great question because the other thing that we haven't talked about that really impacts our ability to progress traffic is the spacing of the signals. Okay. A again, when you're talking about two-way progression, it becomes very sensitive of the spacing of the signals. So, you know, a lot of people, when they're talking about traffic signals, they're thinking of them as a spot improvement. They're mm -hmm. thinking of them as a way to get out of their neighborhood or right. out of a commercial driveway or something like that. And in in that regard, they obviously do help when they're put on a busy street. The problem with that is if they're at a bad spot, it can really affect that progression from light to light as you go up and down the street, which it doesn't necessarily just impact at that light because if there's an untimely stop there, then when they're released from there, they can potentially get stopped again at up the, the next street. Light. And so it really kind of mushrooms. And so when we talk about a traffic signal, we don't really think of them as a spot improvement. We really think of them as a system improvement and we try to place them at locations that are beneficial to the entire system. So when you said a bad spot, what does that mean? I mean too close to a light essentially? 
Yeah, too close N to an not necessarily. Light. I mean, it, 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 it all <clears throat> becomes the spacing, and so sometimes right. it's too close, sometimes it's too long. Oh. It just depends on how it, on how the system is set up. You know, in an ideal world, we'd have signals spaced every half mile. Um, we don't have that because that, that really lends itself to that two-way progression, but we don't have that very many places because there is so much demand for, right. for additional ways to get in and out of places. And so the more you put in at, at awkward or unusual spacings, which I mean, I mean, you know everybody knows, we, you can see that anytime you drive College or Shields right. or some of those streets where there's a lot of signals in there where the spacing isn't really optimal to progress traffic. So is there other solutions, you know, from a traffic engineering standpoint? I mean, I, don't, I just don't even know what the other solution would be. If it's not a good spot for a traffic light, is there other things that, you know, we can do to help those people who are frustrated because they can't get out and make that left turn? Yeah, and, you know, and, and, and sometimes this isn't really what people want to hear, but one of the things that we look at is doing access control, where instead of allowing a full movement intersection, we'll look at making it a right in, right out type of intersection mm. by putting a median in. So instead right. of being able to go left, they might have to go right and around the block type of a thing. Right. Uh, it's less convenient for, for those people doing that, but again, for the system, it can actually right. be better uh, overall. There are you know, so many different options than just the traditional traffic light available, but you know, that's obviously the one I think folks are most familiar with and always see as maybe the right solution. When you guys did this new timing project, um, did you look at one timing pattern per route or does it change based on the time of day? How does the implementation of, of the new routes work? We, we actually look at the traffic flow patterns throughout the day. And you know, so we see the peaks and valleys as, as the day progresses and the changes directionally. Sometimes a day it can be higher volumes northbound high, or higher volumes southbound right. or vice versa. Um, and what we end up doing then is we change the timing plans throughout the course of the day to account for the fluctuating volumes and the varying travel patterns. And so we actually end up with, at most places in town, four different timing plans okay. that run. We, and we run them by time of day. We have like an AM peak plan, a midday plan, a PM peak plan, and then we have a new off-peak plan, which um, probably requires some explanation in and of itself. <laughs> probably a whole other show to itself. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, because what we've been talking about is trying to progress traffic up and down the arterials. Right. The other big, the big complaint or concern that we've heard in Fort Collins is in the evening or early in the morning, sometimes when volumes are lower on the main streets, the weights on the side streets are really excessive. Okay. And that's because up until we implemented this new off-peak plan, we were still running very long cycle lengths even late in the evening. Uh, cycle length is the time it takes to get through everything one time. And okay. so we were running like 110, 120 second cycle lengths at a lot of locations. This new off-peak plan is only an 85 second cycle length, which really cuts down on the side street delays during so those you're lower not just volume times. At that yeah. intersection where you feel like you're the only car and the right. light's not changing. Right. So while we were focusing on on progressing traffic and minimizing stops during the busy parts of the day, during the lower volume times we did try to cut down on those side street delays for people. We talk traffic, we talk about minimizing delays, but there's also a safety component that you guys are looking at. And in fact I think it was last year, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, there was um, you guys are working on this comprehensive study of, of traffic accidents and trying to identify some root causes. And I know um, there were some some great data that came out of that from bikes. Have you guys had that same opportunity to sort of um, dig into the data about car traffic accidents and perhaps what are some you know common mistakes or or common themes among what's going on? We have, and we, we've we've looked specifically at signalized intersections because. Right. Um, which this probably surprises some people, but we actually tend to see more accidents at signalized locations than we do unsignalized locations. Really? It's kind of one of the, 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 the big misunderstandings about traffic signals is that, that a lot of people see them as a cure-all for, for safety issues, when yeah. in reality they actually tend to cause some types of accidents. And so we've been looking at those real closely. We've been identifying signalized intersections that have an unusually high number of accidents, okay. and we're actually looking for for uh, some low cost signal timing adjustments that might be able to improve those situations. So that's interesting. You said that you know traffic lights can actually um, contribute to accident rates. Is there a certain type of accidents that might occur more frequently? Yeah, it's primarily rear end accidents, right. which again, if you're just on the open road and the, it's always green if there's no light. <laughs> right. And anytime we introduce a red light, 
and people have to stop, it gives them an opportunity to run into each other. Right. And so we, do, we tend to see an increase in rear end accidents. And then at some locations, we also see an increase in left turning accidents, which are if you're waiting to turn left and you turn left in somebody in the opposite direction, you're, you know, you're supposed to be yielding and then you turn in front of somebody and they hit you. We, well, s we tend to see more of those at Signal Us yeah. as well. Well, that brings up um, sort of a cool new thing we have, uh, we're testing out here in Fort Collins, and I'm not gonna come up with the right traffic term, Joe, so you'll have to forgive me, but it's essentially a yellow flashing arrow. All right, so tell me about this. That's pretty much it. It's oh, good, a, it's, I it's, used the right term. It's a highly technical term, <laughs> flashing yellow arrow. Uh, basically, this is something that's been being researched for a long time nationwide, uh, particularly by the Federal Highway Administration. They've been looking at ways to minimize these left turn accidents at signalized intersections. And really what we're talking about is what we'd call a permitted left turn, where you're waiting, you're yielding to oncoming traffic, and then when it's clear, you can turn left. Okay. And what they found is right now, the way we do that is with just a green ball. The, the signal displays a green ball, which means you can go, but only after yielding. Um, what they're finding is there's some misunderstanding of the meaning of the green ball some people just won't go, which is really not a safety issue. It's more of an efficiency issue. Mm -hmm. But you know, more concerning is that some people are thinking that green means go, whether it's a, a ball or an arrow, and oh. they're turning left in front of people. And so, like I said, they've, they've looked at a variety of options to try to improve that. And what they've come up with is, is an alternative is this flashing yellow arrow, which will replace the green ball over the left turn lanes and instead will be a yellow arrow that's so flashing. You'll essentially have a, well, in some cases, a green arrow, red arrow, yellow flashing arrow. That's right. Yeah. And so instead of going to a green ball, it'll go to a flashing yellow arrow, which has the same meaning. It still means yield um, and then right. turn when it's safe, but it's going to be different. And, and supposedly from the research that they've done, the, the, the compliance is better with that than it has been with the green ball. So do we actually have that installed right now? Not yet. Okay. We're looking at in the next few months, we're gonna start implementing some of those. And where are you looking at? Can you uh, reveal that information? Yeah, we're looking at some inter intersections along college. Uh, we're gonna start out at college and Foothills at the mall mm, there east, okay. east and west. Right now, we run eastbound first and westbound second, which takes away green time from College Avenue. Right. Uh, we're gonna actually implement the flashing yellow arrow and run east and west together there. Um, which should cool. really improve the, so, our ability to progress traffic up right. and down college. Um, we're also looking at some at college in Monroe and college in Kensington along college, and both of those are con are safety concerns. Okay. And we feel like by running using the flashing yellow arrow, it's going to allow us to do some things differently there that will make those left turns a little bit more safe. So, where's the what's the busiest road? The busiest road here in Fort Collins. College. Most people easily college. college and then Harmony and then Harmony. Yeah. So that actually reminds me. You know what happens when we have these sort of large construction projects? I mean, College and Harmony right now they're doing a lot of work on that intersection. Do you have to retime that entire route because of some of the work going on there? We didn't retime the entire route. We retimed that intersection, sure. but we we kept the synchronization so that when people are being released, say northbound from College and Harmony, they're still in step with the other lights going up College. Uh, in the same on Harmony, but it, the reality is getting through that intersection, there really isn't any progression because right. of the congestion. And so, you know, we've, we've, we've retimed that to try to get people good, through as good as we can, um, but it was mainly focused right there at that intersection. How often do you change uh, timing patterns? You've said we just sort of went through this whole retiming project um, that we implemented last year. So we're just sort of seeing the results. Yeah. Um, do we do that constantly? Is it an annual project? Well, that one was actually uh, a, a federal grant that we had oh. to do that project. And so we looked at the entire city all at once. Oh, very um, cool. And, you know, we like to try to do that on a regular basis as things change. Um, the reality, though, is, is that we don't always have that kind of money to do that. So right. it's, it's more of a, uh, an ongoing, you know, we've got a good, a good, baseline right now with these new timing plans that we've got right. but now it's more of a, a looking at individual locations that maybe need some tweaking here and there and so we're going to be doing that here for the next probably several years looking sure. at things and making changes and then you know down the road if the economy picks back up and volumes start changing a lot we'd look at, at redoing things on an as needed as a needed basis sure that's an interesting link so do you actually see more people driving when you know 
times are good? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Volumes really? are actually down a little bit right now compared huh. to historic, you know, when, when things were going good in the early 2000s. Um, I mean, not significantly, but they're definitely right. down, down or at best just staying even right now. Wow, that's really interesting. I never realized that. So we talked a little bit about, um, you know, all the things you guys are doing to help move cars, but you guys aren't only talking about cars. You guys also uh, are involved with our bike program and pedestrian access. And there's a new signal on the south end of town, I believe, um, that is now this term I think I actually do have right, a pedestrian beacon. Close. Ah, darn it. All right, what is it? It's a pedestrian hybrid beacon. Oh, see, just it, one word. <laughs> it's a hybrid. They call it a hybrid because it's a hybrid between a traffic signal and a warning beacon. It kind of combines the two. And we put our first one in uh, earlier this year over on Harmony at Regency. And basically what it is is, is when a pedestrian pushes the button, the light goes red for motorists on Harmony. And of course, by law, they have to stop for the red light. Right. But after a short time, then the light goes from solid red to flashing red, which then, if the pedestrians are gone or it's clear to go, motorists are allowed to proceed on the flashing red. Just like you would at a stop sign, you'd treat it like a stop sign right. with a flashing red light on the top of it. You can come up and stop, and if it's safe to go, then you can go. And so it's, the idea is that it's giving the positive protection of a red light to pedestrians to protect right. them but it doesn't necessarily have the full delay for motorists that a normal signal right. would have, so or they just have to stay at a red light for a fast people time. that zooms across right. your crosswalk, right. the car's not still waiting for the light to turn again. Right, because we have to time the light for kind of the slowest pedestrian that might go sure. across there. But like you said, a lot of people are on bikes or jogging and things like that where they're across so much faster, and then it's just excess delay, excess fuel consumed, excess air pollution. And it also tends to make some people impatient and when they see the light go yellow or whatever, they try to Got bust it. through it. Yeah. And so we don't necessarily have great compliance or as good of compliance as we'd like at some of our pedestrian signals. So this is a way to try to get the best of both worlds. As a pedestrian, do you notice the difference? Does it look different? Not for pedestrians. It's basically you still push the button and you wait for the walk light to go. Yeah. And it's the same thing at these as it would be at a regular signal. So when did we install that? Um, it was in February. Okay. How's it going? So far, so good. It, it, and, and, you know, these have been tried other places. And, right. and what people told us is the biggest thing you'll see is you'll see motorists who aren't willing to go on the flashing red. Right. But that's that's making a mistake. And I don't call it a mistake. It, it's being conservative. Right. It's, it's not just, it's, it's okay because nobody's going to get hurt because of it. We'd right. rather have people being conservative and, and not going rather than just blowing through. And so that's just exactly what we've seen. We've seen a lot of people who aren't willing to go, but, but we're okay with that because it's just, it's an efficiency thing, but it's certainly not a safety issue. We talked about the yellow flashing arrow. Are there any other intersections or new tools or new tricks you have up your sleeve that um, you're thinking about testing out here in Fort Collins? Well, they're not necessarily new anymore, but obviously we've got round. <laughs> they're, they're, they're new to me. <laughs> we've got roundabouts to talk right. about. Uh, in the right locations, uh, roundabout, roundabouts make a lot of sense, and we're always looking at locations where there's potential for roundabouts to be used instead of signals. You know, they've got a lot of advantages as far as, um, you know, the, the conflict points, so they tend to be safer than signalized right. intersections. You know, we talked about this accident issues at signals. We don't see those at roundabouts. Right. Uh, they don't have any power to be consumed, and so once they're in, the maintenance on them is a lot lower than it is for a traffic signal. Um, and, and the delays tend to be lower for people in a lot of cases. So uh, we're always looking for places to use roundabouts too. I mean, the use of roundabouts seems sort of like a learned behavior. You know, a lot of people um, were initially uncomfortable with it and then people get used to it. And, you know, I used to live up in Vail and there's, you know, always roundabouts. And so you just sort of, uh, soon it becomes your habit. You don't even think twice about it. Does that take sort of a long time for a community to embrace that idea? especially when you're using both roundabouts and traffic signals? I think so. I think anything new tends to be, uh, you know, uncomfortable. And so sure. a, a lot of people, you know, aren't on board with roundabouts yet. And so uh, we're working to, one, make sure we're using them where they make sense, and then, two, trying to educate people and help them understand the benefits of the roundabouts. Right. Right. Well, uh, I I've been to your website. There's tons of information about traffic safety and uh, the safety data, the accident data that you guys have collected. There's information about actually the success of the re-timing project. Um, 
fcgov.com slash traffic. traffic. Mm -hmm. I always tease you, Joe, because I, there's more to traffic engineering than I ever knew possible. And uh, I appreciate you coming on the show and talking to us a little bit about it. And we're going to have you come back maybe uh, in another year, and we'll see just how much faster we are getting through town than this year. Sounds good. Thank, <laughs> thank you for having me. Thanks, Joe. And thanks you all for watching. We'll see you next time on Studio 14.